Before we start, I would like to say this. Most people that know the guys would not consider them as monsters. A more mature mind would categorize them as misguided youth growing up in unfortunate circumstances. They are a product of their environment and most don't take accountability or even see what they are doing wrong, if they are doing wrong. If you ask, it was out of a sense of protecting oneself and those around them, the ones you come up with, your day ones. There is an exception to some, who are just downright devious. But enough of that, let's get into this. And they say these crews wreaked havoc on the Millbrook houses for years. Right now, maximum potential sentences are up to life in prison. Millbrook projects are bordered by East 135th Street to the south, East 137th Street to the north, Cypress Avenue to the east, and Brook Avenue to the west. They are located on a hill, where the hill slopes from uphill in the east to downhill in the west. The MBG gang was formed by a group of individuals living in the up-the-block section of the Millbrook houses in the Bronx. MBG stood for Millbrook Gangsters. Millbrook consists of 10 buildings, 3 buildings buildings 8, 9, and 10 constitute what is known as Up the Block Millbrook. MBG's chief rival was a gang known as Kilbrook, whose members were from the down the block section of the Millbrook houses. The members were generally from buildings 1, 2, 3, and 4. MBG's rivalry with Kilbrook began in 2007, after an MBG member shot an individual from down the block. The rivalry turned the Millbrook houses into a war zone, where MBG members regularly attempted to murder Kilbrook members, and vice versa. MBG members made money by selling drugs in the Millbrook houses. They generally sold crack cocaine and marijuana. MBG members stored drugs in the apartment of MBG and YG member James. They also bagged up drugs and made sales out of that apartment. One of the key rules of MBG was that its members could not cooperate with law enforcement. This was true even if the cooperation involved a rival gang member. If an MBG member cooperated with law enforcement, he could be kicked out of the gang. For example, after an MBG member cooperated with law enforcement against a rival who shot him, a leader approached the gang member and told him he could no longer be in the gang. The YGs were a larger gang formed by Juther Perez in the early 2000s. The YGs started in the Patterson houses in the Bronx, but expanded to include sets of the gang and other housing projects, such as the Millbrook houses. The highest ranking YGs were known as the Top 5. Members of the Top 5 had the ability to create new sets within the YGs. Each set of the YGs had a leader, who was known as the Big Gun. The Big Gun of a set had the ability to bring new members into the YGs. Upon joining the YGs, members are taught the YGs handshake and YGs gang signs. Sometime in 2010, Millbrook was made YG by Mighty, who was a high-ranking member of the gang in its entirety. We did a story on him, so you can watch that if you want. YG members rose in the ranks by committing acts of violence for the gang, such as shootings. For example, after committing numerous shootings, Mike became a big gun within the YGs and was rewarded with his own set, the self-made gunners. Like MBG members, YG members made money by selling drugs in the Millbrook houses. There is no need to describe Kilbrook, which controlled the other side of the projects. They engaged in the same acts of violence. We will say this though, many, but not all members of Kilbrook, were also members of the G-Shine Bloods and YBs at time. They would go on to harbor members of the Mac Bowlers. We decided not to do a profile piece and do the complete war in a nutshell. Many of the guys grew up pretty much the same, some a little better than others. Either way though, they were faced with the same adversity when they stepped out the apartment. For some, it was in the homes as well. So, let's get into it. Joey was a big gun and leader in the Millbrook houses. Because of his prolific drug dealing, he would earn the name, Joey Crack. This is not Joey Crack, but you get the point. The first shooting took place in 2007. Around that time, Joey Crack shot and hit Gio, who was from down the block Millbrook. The shooting started the rivalry between MBG and Kilbrook. The next shooting took place in or about September 2007. Earlier on the day of the shooting, Gio tried to shoot at Joey Crack. Joey Crack then saw Gio and Gio's girlfriend later that day, and he shot at them as they walked past a building in the Millbrook houses. No one was hit. Joey Crack was in a convenience store with other MBG members, when Big K, a member of Kilbrook, and another individual spotted them. The two Kilbrook members shot at Joey. Joey Crack returned fire, but no one was hit in the shootout. By October 2007, Joey Crack was involved in another shooting. 
He was outside of a building when he shot at a window where he could see two Kilbrook associates inside the building. No one was hit in this shooting. Millbrook in general did not get along with certain other projects. Even though the projects had internal beef, you couldn't just come to the projects unless you was good with certain members. Don't get caught on the wrong side if you if affiliated with one or the other. With that being said, we must mention this. On or about October 28, 2007, a dispute arose between Kilbrook members and MBG members, because Kilbrook members invited individuals from the Mitchell houses to a party in the Millbrook houses. At the time, MBG was feuding with a gang from the Mitchell houses, because someone from the Mitchell houses had robbed an MBG member. At the party, a brawl erupted between MBG and Kilbrook members, and during the course of that brawl, an MBG member shot a Kilbrook member, hitting him in the ankle. Two guys, Cofield and Innes, supplied drugs to the gang members and others in the area, who, in turn, distributed the drugs in and around the Millbrook houses. Money from narcotics trafficking was used to purchase guns and ammunition, among other items, that benefited the gangs. Cofield lived in a particular apartment in the Millbrook houses, where gang members regularly hung out. The apartment was used in connection with drug dealing. For example, Cofield and others cooked drugs in the apartment. Drugs were also stored and sold in the apartment. In addition, handguns belonging to MBG gang members were stored in drawers in the apartment. Cofield and Willow were both members of the Bloods gang. At some point in this time, Cofield had been shot in the hand in a shooting set up by Willow. At this point, you could say Willow was aligned with Kilbrook. Cofield was waiting for a good time to retaliate, and in January of 2010, he would exact his revenge. Before this though, there would be one extreme act of violence. In 2009, down the block Kilbrook member, Ruger, shot an up the block MBG member in the back. The victim survived. Ruger would go on to commit a brazen shooting not long after this. The rivalry then escalated in the beginning of 2010, when there were several shootings between the two crews. It gets really ugly from here on out. Cofield was still planning his get back at Willow. One day, he caught Willow and shot him in the face. Willow survived, but lost his eye after the shooting. Like we said earlier, Mike was a leader of MBG and YG. He had his own set, and its name was self-explanatory, the self-made gunners. Through January 25, 2010 and February 12, 2010, a span of some 18 days, Mike personally committed five shootings, which resulted in injuries to seven people. On January 25, 2010, Kilbrook member, Jose, followed and White on the subway and told and White that he wanted to hurt Mike. After and White got off the subway, and White was jumped by Polo and Rob Lowe, two other Kilbrook members. After the attack, and White went to Mike's apartment and told him what happened. Mike and and White planned to jointly retaliate against individuals from down the block. However, a couple of hours later, Mike came to the apartment where and White was and emptied out shell casings from a 357 revolver. Mike told and White that he shot Jose and thought he had killed him. Less than a week later, on January 31, 2010, Mike and White and others were in the community center in the Millbrook houses to celebrate the baby shower of Kilimo, a member of MBG. During the baby shower, Kilbrook members, including Jose, came in and out. Jose approached Mike and told Mike that he better hold it down, as in he should not talk to the police if Jose retaliated. Mike then made a phone call, and shortly after the call, an individual came through the crowded baby shower, brought Mike the 357 he used to shoot Jose the first time. A fight between MBGYG members and Kilbrook members then broke out, among children and other party goers at the shower. After that, Kilbrook member, Ruger, entered the baby shower and started shooting at MBGYG members, hitting an innocent bystander. The bystander was an MTA worker. An MBG member was injured during the shooting. Mike then went into the community center kitchen. As Ruger walked by, Mike reached around the door and shot Ruger in the back. That same day, shortly after Mike shot Ruger, Mike and White and other MBGYG members were walking together towards the up-the-block section of Millbrook. On their way, they ran into Kaz, a leader in Kilbrook. Mike shot a Kaz and then chased him towards a building in the Millbrook houses. Mike then shot Kaz from behind at close range, causing Kaz to fall over a gate and suffer life-threatening injuries. Mike, after twice hitting Kaz with bullets in the head and causing him to fall to the ground, pulled the trigger of his revolver multiple times directly at Kaz's head, but the gun was out of bullets. 
The doctor explained that the bullet had injured cause inferior vena cava, which is the main vein bringing blood from the lower half of the body, and as a result, cause lost 5 liters of blood. This is about as much blood as there is in the human body, in other words, cause bled out. After surgery, which was not initially successful, Cause was transferred to the intensive care unit, where he was kept on a ventilator, because he was not yet stable enough to be safely awakened. It is rare to survive this type of attack. Cause would recover though. On February 12, 2010, Mike went to the high school that Kilbrook member Quentin, aka Polo, had attended. While waiting outside the high school, Mike saw Q jump another YG member. Mike then followed Q until he was in the vicinity of another school. Q spotted Mike and started walking towards Mike, so Mike shot a Q, grazing him with a bullet. Shortly after this, a truce was garnered between the crews. Sometime during 2011, up the block member, Papa, would shoot at members from the Kirtland Avenue for thinking they could attend a party in Millbrook. Not sure if this happened before or after this next situation. In March 2011, there was a party in 530 East 137th Street that was attended by members of both MBG and Kilbrook, including Joey Crack and Reckless. Reckless was the brother of Big K. During the party, Reckless became upset with MBG members because they showed up to the party with an individual named Cash from the nearby Bettens' houses. Reckless had problems with Cash because Cash had previously hit him in the head with a brick, resulting in severe injuries. Reckless then obtained a firearm from another Kilbrook member and attempted to shoot Cash and MBG members, including Papa and Joey Crack, in the hallway and elevator located outside of the apartment where the party was being thrown. Reckless then ran down the stairs in the building. Joey Crack and Papa then took the elevator downstairs and saw Reckless in front of the building. Papa grabbed the gun from Joey Crack, took the safety off, and shot at Reckless twice. No one was hit. Shortly after this shooting, Joey Crack reached out to Reckless and proposed a meeting. Reckless and Papa was going to get the one-on, or fight one-on-one, -on -one, in the hopes of arriving at a truce. It was a lot of violence going on and ultimately, Joey Crack knew that they couldn't sell drugs with so much police presence. During the meeting, however, Reckless spotted MBG members and White, Rod and Bettens' member, Cash, lurking behind a nearby building. Reckless believed that he and his Kilbrook members were being set up. Reckless and other Kilbrook members left the meeting location, retrieved a firearm, went to MBG territory to retaliate, and began shooting. There would be no truce between MBG and Kilbrook. Joey's girlfriend would be killed as a result of all of this. Bolivia was 21 years old and had a 4-year-old daughter. She was working in Toys R Us at the time. She was a beautiful girl. A few weeks after the encounter at the party, she and Joey Crack walked to a local hair salon located down the block in rival Kilbrook territory. As they walked, Joey Crack and Bolivia came across Big K, Reckless, and several other Kilbrook members standing in front of a store. During the encounter, Reckless gestured to Joey Crack, indicating that there was still bad blood between the two sides. Allegedly, he was on some, you lucky you got your girl with you type time. Joey Crack and Bolivia continued towards the salon. Immediately after Joey Crack and Bolivia walked away, Big K, Reckless, and two other Kilbrook members began plotting to kill Joey Crack. Ultimately, they decided that Big K and Reckless would obtain firearms and shoot Joey Crack when he returned to MBG territory. The other two Kilbrook members would wait nearby and hold open the front door to Reckless's building so that he and Big K had a place to flee after the shooting. The planning process was extremely quick. So quick, in fact, that, despite the fact that Joey Crack and Bolivia only spent a few minutes inside the salon, every Kilbrook member who had previously been outside the store was gone by the time Joey Crack and Bolivia decided to return to MBG territory. Indeed, Big K and Reckless were inside Reckless's bedroom, preparing to kill Joey Crack. There, Reckless put on a red hooded sweatshirt and grabbed a 9mm handgun and provided Big K with a dark colored sweatshirt and a 22 caliber handgun. Big K and Reckless then left the apartment and went looking for Joey Crack. They found Joey Crack and Bolivia standing near the 640 building. Big K raised the 22 caliber handgun and opened fire first, striking Bolivia in the process. Reckless then began shooting the 9mm. After firing multiple bullets, Big K and Reckless fled the scene and ran back to Reckless's building. There, they provided the firearms to another Kilbrook member for disposal, changed their clothing, and quickly left the area. Police officers arrived at the scene shortly after the shooting. 
Upon their arrival, they observed Bolivia lying on the ground near the 640 building, suffering from a single gunshot wound to the head. Bolivia was rushed to Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx, where she would eventually succumb to her injuries just a few days later. The police officers at the scene of the shooting began searching the area for evidence. Among other things, the police officers recovered from near the 620 building, 722 caliber shell casings and 5 9mm shell casings. The portion of the bullet that killed Bolivia was removed from her brain. It was the 22. Months after Bolivia's death, Big K met with Oze near the Millbrook houses. Oze asked him what happened during the shooting. Big K explained to Oze, among other things, that him and his brother were trying to shoot Joey Crack because he was highly regarded within the MBG gang and Bolivia was simply in the wrong place, wrong time. In May 2011, Joey Crack shot Kilbrook member, AJ in the arm. AJ is a beloved member from Kilbrook, he was getting to it. That same month though, Joey Crack also shot at other Kilbrook members by a mobile command center near the Millbrook houses. No one was hit. On or about July 4, 2011, MBG member, Pun, was with Joey Crack and MBG member, Rod, at a sneaker store. While they were there, they saw two rival gang members, Kaz and AJ. Pun, Joey Crack, and Rod left the store and began walking back to the Millbrook houses. Joey Crack then saw Bulu, another rival gang member. Joey Crack tried to shoot, but the safety was on. Pun then took the gun and shot at Bulu. It's believed that there was a shootout, but I'm not sure if Bulu was shooting back in this particular situation. No one was hit though. But later that day, Joey Crack would spot Bulu again and attempt to shoot at him. No one was hit this time neither. Just to mention. Ant was a member of MBG and the YGs. He is the brother of James, and MBG members often went their house to do what they do. Not sure what was going on at the time, but it's alleged that he shot at Mighty while Mighty was in the polo grounds. If you know, you know. But by November 15, 2011, the big gun, Mighty, gets into something while at Millbrook. We spoke about this on the Mighty story. Anyway the Murder More Gangsters, MMG, harbor the Moore houses on 3rd Avenue. They were also once YGs at a time. Anyway they shot at Mighty and another member on this particular night. The two participated in a swift retaliation. Shortly after, Mighty and the homie got the 4-5 and the 9, spin to MMG, and long story short, an MMG member got hit running towards the chicken spot on Concord Avenue. Not sure if the guy with Mighty was Pun, who had shot Bulu four months prior. Speaking of Pun though, he did shot someone in the groin in November, according to documents, and also, in December of 11, he shot and injured a man who bumped into Pun's fellow gang member in a store. This same year, Andy, a Kilbrook member, shot at rival gang members from a park in the middle of the Millbrook houses. David was a member of MBG and has a long history of arrests dating back to age 14. At that age, he was charged with robbery and adjudicated a juvenile delinquent. Shortly after his release, in June 2006, he was charged with murder. He was adjudicated a youthful offender after a plea of guilty to manslaughter. After his release in 2011, he returned to gang activity. So on April 16, 2012, beloved Kirtland member Noah was murdered by the YGs, more so by the members that came from around Morris Avenue. Some time after the murder of Noah, a picture would be posted dealing with a YGs member taking a picture in MMG territory. Based on affiliations during the time, the photo would cause more friction in the whole YGOG campaign. MMG's affiliations was what they were, and since we haven't covered them yet, we won't reveal anything here. Anyway, this is not about MMG, so let's move along. By late 2011, Cofield would broker a truce between up the hill and down the hill. Again, the peace would not last long. Mike had been locked up from February of 2010 to August of 2012. He would get right back to it. After going through all this, it's hard to just come home and be a regular citizen, not impossible, but definitely hard. The beef was still on. On October 28, 2012, Mike and White, Joey Crack, and MBGYG member, David, began following a group of people who were not from their neighborhood. They followed the group to the Cypress Avenue subway station, just a few blocks from Mill Brook. Once they got there, Mike and David followed the group into the subway station. Mike asked Ra and his group what gang they were in. After Ra said he was a blood, Mike began shooting, hitting Ra in the stomach, who suffered life-threatening injuries. He also hit two others named Rod and Shaq. 
White pulled the trigger not just once, not from a distance, but multiple times at close range. He could feel Mike's gun on his stomach in the subway station. Allegedly, Mike said what's bossing. Which is a greeting used by the young bosses. One of the individuals in the subway station then said we bossing. In response, Mike said we gunning, which signified his affiliation with the YGs. Mike then shot at the individuals multiple times with a 380 caliber firearm. An NYPD officer recovered shell casings and a fired bullet from inside the Cypress Avenue subway station. The shell casings and bullet match test fires from the 380 caliber high point firearm, which Mike was arrested in possession of six weeks later on December 8, 2012. Approximately one month before trial, Mike had reached out to him by telephone regarding his anticipated cooperation with law enforcement. Allegedly, Mike told him that he knew Ra had identified Mike as the guy that shot him. Ra denied having done so, which was a lie, and Mike responded, I like the sound of that, but we not going to talk like that over the phone. Mike sent Ra a paper in the mail that included the lineup picture with him circling Mike's picture and Ra's signature on it, and another typed up paper, stating that everything the cops was saying were a lie, and that's not his handwriting. Ra ultimately decided not to sign the paper. David who we spoke about earlier, was with Mike when Mike was arrested. David jumped in front of the arresting officer as the officer was arresting Mike. Two months later, on or about February 4, 2013, a Kilbrook member shot at David. David then met with CW1 and other MBGYG members. After that, David left and retrieved a 40 caliber handgun, which had been used by a fellow gang member in the murder of Tashim Ferguson on December 22, 2011. CW1 then went to the downhill side of Millbrook to scout whether police were present. CW1 returned and told David that police were present, but nonetheless, David left with a gun and shot and injured a Kilbrook member in the middle of the Millbrook houses. On or about February 6, 2013, David was arrested after he was found in possession of a loaded 22 caliber revolver. Now I'm not sure who CW1 is, but I will say that in white, other YGs from the Patterson-Morris area such as Tall J was later charged in connection to the murder of Tashim Ferguson. Moving along though. Andy had committed a shooting in 2011 on behalf of Kilbrook. In 2008, while out on bail for a robbery, he had been shot by an unknown assailant in a convenience store. In 2012, he was also shot during a conflict dealing with his old neighborhood. But in or about 2013, Andy shot at rival gang members in the vicinity of the Millbrook houses. On or about June 2, 2013, CW2 and Papa went to Millbrook. Upon arriving, Papa fired gunshots, but no one was hit. In the winter of 2013, CW2, Stutter, Mighty, and other YGs and MBG members went to the downhill section of Millbrook to shoot at gang members from Kilbrook. CW2 brought a 9mm pistol, and Mighty also had a firearm. Stutter acted as a lookout. When they got there, the Kilbrook members spotted them and shot at them first. Mighty shot back in response. CW2 then also shot back at the Kilbrook members. No one was hit in the blaze of bullets. A year later, in December of 2013, Kilbrook member, Rugger, shot at rival MBG members who came to Kilbrook turf in the downhill section of the Millbrook houses. Remember him, he was the one that shot up the baby shower. Even before this December shooting though, he shot and injured a rival gang member on April 12 that same year. The bullets hit the victim in the chest and the left arm, but the victim survived. As such, Rugger was a regular shooter and one of the most violent members of Kilbrook. Rugger was also involved in selling crack cocaine. On August 17, 2014, Juju committed a shooting that resulted in injuries to three people, including Scraps, a rival Kilbrook gang member. Three years prior, in 2011, Scraps had broken Juju's jaw during a gang fight between MBG and Kilbrook members. He was at a restaurant near Millbrook when Scraps and other Kilbrook members walked in. Scraps approached Juju and punched him in the face. Whether Juju was with other MBG members at the time was unclear. Juju told and White that he was going to shoot Scraps in response. And White didn't jump to retaliate. Nobody really seemed to make any moves, and Juju was pretty upset about that. He held it down though, and figured he would have to make a statement on his own. During 2014, things were a bit hostile, but also a bit calm. Some senior members could at least have a conversation about certain things that was going on before straight shooting someone down. There had been one whole year with no shooting between the gangs. 
At 3.10 a.m. on August 17, 2014, two officers were patrolling on 138th Street between St. Anne's Avenue and Brook Avenue when they received a report of shots fired at a block over. Upon arriving at the scene, the officers saw one person who had been shot, as well as two other people who were complaining that they had been shot. He also observed a large group of people standing around a nearby deli. Police later identified the victims as Scraps, AJ, and also another victim. AJ had been shot by Joey Crack in 2011. Before the shooting, Kilbrook member, Melendez, Pete that John from up the block, was also hanging around outside the store. Melendez thought it was weird for John to be there because people from up the block typically did not go down the block and vice versa. Eventually, Melendez and his friends, but not John, made their way back into the projects, specifically, into the courtyard between buildings 165 and 530. Melendez, John and Scraps spent the night hanging out, drinking, and smoking near the flagpole in that courtyard. At some point, Melendez saw one of his friends freeze. When Melendez followed his gaze, he saw Juju approaching from St. Anne's Avenue with the same person from up the block who Melendez had noticed earlier in the night. After they arrived, Juju started shooting. Melendez heard shots being fired and ran to his apartment in Building 165. Sometime later, Melendez went up the block with a gun looking for Juju because he wanted to retaliate. Melendez did not find Juju, but instead ran into Joey Crack, someone named Dre, and another person whose name he did not know. Melendez, who was upset, asked them if they knew where Juju was and if they knew why he had shot at the group down the block. Melendez also told Joey Crack and the others about what he witnessed. On the night of the shooting, Joey Crack was alone in up the block Millbrook selling drugs. At some point, Melendez approached him kind of anxiously and with an attitude and asked where Juju was, but did not say anything more. After this interaction, Joey Crack texted his friends, specifically, Ann White, Aunt, Papa, and James, to find out what was going on. Joey Crack explained that he wanted to know what happened in case someone tried to retaliate. As a leader of MBG, Joey Crack felt that he would be a target for any act of retaliation by someone from down the block. And White was at a strip club on the night of the shooting. He heard from Joey Crack that something had happened in Millbrook. And White stayed at the strip club for some time after that and then went back to his apartment to hang out with his girlfriend. While well there, and White called Melendez to find out what had happened. Eventually, and White left his apartment and went down the block to meet Melendez. And White brought a gun with him for this meeting because, having heard that something happened, he did not want to go down the block empty handed. Melendez told him what happened, and then and White went back home for the night. A week or two later, and White discussed the shooting with John. John told him that he went down the block with a girl, called Juju to tell him that Scraps was in the park and that Juju shot Scraps. About a month and a half after the shooting, and White saw Juju, John, and Devin at a restaurant near Millbrook. And White's relationship with Juju was not really cool at this point. Juju had been telling people that he had issues with and White because and White would not help Juju retaliate after he got cut by someone from another housing project. And White, who was angry about this, asked John to tell Juju that he should stay in Staten Island because and White would punch him in the face the next time they saw each other. When and White tried to peace Juju that day, Juju confronted and White about this threat. In response, and White punched Juju in the face. Juju threw his hands up, but nobody swung. Juju then told and Whitey would do him dirty, and White then said to Juju, you think you're tough because you shot scraps, and told Juju to get your gun. Similar to how the dipset rapper Cameron said it on the battle with the locks on versus. Afterward though, and White went back to his apartment to get his guns two 357s and then went down the block to an apartment. When he got there, he saw John outside and told him to get Juju. Juju never came out, however, and eventually and White went home. The next day, and White awoke to several missed calls and text messages telling him that Juju wanted to fight. Around 8 p.m. that night, the two fought. Allegedly, and White beat Juju up. John ultimately broke up the fight and the two squashed their problems. They pieced each other and that was that. Sometime after the shooting, a memorial was held in Millbrook for AJ, who had passed away in a car accident. Killbrook members refer to area as Cedar World, which is in remembrance of AJ. People from both up and down the block, including Juju, were present. When Melendez saw Juju, Melendez asked him what happened with his aim. 
Allegedly, Juju was only trying to shoot one person, but a couple of others ended up getting hit. Juju kind of laughed in response, and Melendez told him that people were upset. Juju clarified that he was only coming for scraps and was not trying to hit anyone else. Melendez told Juju that he would deliver the message, but he did not know how much this apology would accomplish. In or about December 2014, CW2, O-Block, and other YGs went to the territory of a rival gang known as the Young Shooters to commit a shooting. O-Block carried CW2's 357 revolver to the location of the shooting. When they arrived, O-Block passed the gun to another YG, who fired gunshots at YSG, or Young Shooters gang members. No one was hit. YSG was beefing with the YGs and beefed with MMG as well. Around 2015, Juju ran into Kilbrook member, Oze, who at the time, was working on the Staten Island Ferry. When Oze saw Juju on the ferry that day, Juju approached him kind of aggressively and asked Oze if he wanted to fight because of the time he robbed Juju. Allegedly, back in 2009, Rodriguez and another Kilbrook member named Quentin were walking around the neighborhood looking for rivals, something they did to get status. Just for a reminder, Quentin, also known as Polo, along with fellow Kilbrook member Rob Lowe, had jumped hand wide in 2010, and Rodriguez had also been shot at or shot by Mike in 2010 in retaliation. Anyway, Polo and Rodriguez had the drop on Juju. When they saw Juju entering a store in up the block mill brook, they decided to follow him. Once inside the store, Rodriguez threatened Juju with a razor and told him to turn over whatever possessions he had. Juju handed over his jacket and cell phone, among other items. Later, Rodriguez and his fellow gang members carved KB into the back of the jacket and took a video of the jacket being lit on fire. Now here it is, 2015, they were having this convo, six years after the robbery. So Juju is basically asking what's the energy. Jose replied that fighting would only spark up energy and start something up again between MBG and Kilbrook, which Jose did not think they should do. Juju agreed and, noting that Jose and Polo had not really hurt him during the robbery, told Jose that he would forget about it. Juju then told Jose that his main focus down the block was scraps. Jose believed that Scraps broke Juju's jaw because, after moving to Millbrook from Queens, he was trying to get in good with Kilbrook, so he put in work on Juju, since Juju was MBG. Scraps and Juju did not have any interactions before Scraps moved into Millbrook. On or about April 27, 2015, O Block provided a gun to Wes. Wes, while carrying the gun, then went with 80 Mies to pick up O Block brother from a school in between the Millbrook houses and the Mitchell houses. A.D. Mies and Wes then saw gang members from the Mitchell houses, chased after them, and shot at them. No one was hit. By July of that year, CW2 was attacked in the Bronx by rival gang members. CW2 later learned that a particular rival gang member was involved in setting up the attack. Later that day, CW2 shot at the individual with fellow YG members. After that, CW2 went back to his apartment to hang out with Papa and other YGs. While at his apartment, CW2 received a telephone call with threats and warnings from the individual. Papa and other YGs then left the apartment to shoot at the individual because they didn't take threats lightly. Another YG member, O Block, then shot at the individual. No one was hit. In or about 2015, CW2 heard that individuals from the Cypress Avenue area were taking pictures in front of his building. Stutter also called CW2 and told CW2 that the individuals from Cyprus were coming and intended to shoot CW2. Later that day, CW2 talked to Stutter and Stutter told him that he shot at the individuals from Cyprus with a 380 caliber gun and they shot back. The shooting happened in the vicinity of 138th Street and Cypress Avenue. No one was hit. Mick was a member of the YGs. He shot and injured a rival gang member in the vicinity of 320 Beekman Avenue, not sure, but 80 Mies may have accompanied him in the shooting. On or about August 14, 2015, law enforcement agents obtained a judicially authorized search warrant to search the premises where and White was believed to reside. Five days later, law enforcement agents executed the search at 169 Cypress Avenue. Upon entering and White's crib, officers discovered three adults and one child. Officers identified one of the adults as in white. They handcuffed the three adults and secured the in white premises in advance of the search. And white identified one of the rooms as his bedroom. Law enforcement agents entered the bedroom and discovered a locked safe. 
And White provided the combination for the safe and law enforcement agents opened the safe. In the safe, they found approximately 92 baggies containing what looked like crack, about 440 caliber rounds, two 12-gauge shotgun shells, 357, 9mm bullets, 38 caliber bullets, the whole enchilada. A police lieutenant then asked in white, in sum and substance, whether law enforcement agents would find any guns in the crib. And White responded that there was no gun there, but that another individual had the gun at their apartment. And White gave law enforcement agents the address and stated that law enforcement agents needed to get to the apartment today, or the gun would not be there. After the discovery of the ammunition and the crack cocaine, and White was placed under arrest. After his arrest, and White was transported to the 40th police precinct in the Bronx, where NYPD officers conducted a videotaped interview with and White. And White was read his Miranda rights, which he waived orally. After learning that the gun was at this individual's apartment, law enforcement agents proceeded to conduct surveillance. At approximately 1 p.m., on or about August 19, 2015, an officer observed a person's hand in a window throwing out a plastic bag. The bag fell onto a fenced, grassy area next to the building. Officers found the 40 caliber in the bag. From here, there is not much happens in this timeline. Some guys mentioned in this story would go on to commit murders or acts of violence in Rikers Island. We will be doing a story in the future on the wars and different sets that are going at each other there. This about wraps it up. Some of these guys got deals due to their cooperation, some are fighting the case and some are doing a lot of time. For example, Mike was sentenced to 20 years. But yeah, as always stay low and thanks for watching.